All right, guys, so this video, as you see, is entitled A Brief History of Political Science. So it's a brief history. I'm going to be going through this pretty quickly. It's a lot of information to cover. This might be about an hour long um, discussion. Just a brief history of political science, the introduction to political science, literally. So the government of the United States. Um... So what we're going to be covering is the U.S. Constitution, rights, civil liberties, civil rights, elections and parties, public opinion and media, the three branches, domestic and foreign policy. For sure, in this video, I won't be covering domestic and foreign policy. I will be briefly discussing the three branches of government. So more people live inside... More people live in Europe. What part of the world is this, actually? I'm not really sure. We'll skip that information. We're going to stick strictly with the U.S., but the majority of people live in a particular part of the world. More people live inside this circle than outside of it. I don't know if anybody knows where this is at, what part of the world is at. I don't want to say it's Russia. I don't want to say, I would assume maybe it's the Middle East somewhere. So the U.S. has been the world's political, military, and cultural leader since 1945. Wow, it's only 80 years ago. The U.S. is less than 5% of the world population, yet we are 20% of the world economy. U.S. cultural output, movies, music, games, etc. is ubiquitous worldwide. English is the language of international business, science, diplomacy, etc., U.S. military has troops deployed in nearly every country and permanent bases in nearly half. The U.S. Navy protects all global shipping lanes. It says all global shipping lanes. Wow. So in this brief video, we'll be discussing political differences uh, are about competing values and making trade-offs. So in America, the political parties are about competing values and making trade-offs. So... We'll be talking about power, state power, private, public, its use and abuse, philosophical basis on political principles such as rights, relationship between economics and political science, put the science in political science, effects of technological change on politics. Maybe we won't be discussing that in this video. Um, so how should a government fund a public good? Users pay most of the costs, car, gas, taxes, park fees. Um, for a school, such as public school and public health, costs are more spread out. Um, could be like government, funds, grants. So California Community Colleges, uh, the price per unit is 46 bucks. Uh, percentage of costs from student fees, 4%. U.S. average is $175 and 30% of costs from student fees. Highest cost states are usually around 300 bucks per unit, 65%. The student comes out of pocket to pay that. That's per unit. So junior colleges in California um, are a lot more affordable. Uh, one could be because they're trying to get you to go on to higher education so you can finally have to get a loan, which is kind of confusing that they give you financial aid in junior college, but then you ultimately are being led to take on a bigger loan. So California has the lowest community college student fee in the country. At $46 per unit, a student taking 15 units per semester would pay $1,380 per year. Uh, additionally, nearly half of California community college students have all students' fees waived. So nearly half of the students in California have all their fees waived. I am one. Student fees are not the only cost to college. Housing, materials, transportation, child care, opportunity costs... Must also be accounted for. <clears throat> All right, politics, government, who cares? The activities of those with more power than you and I affect us whether we like it or not. So politics, who cares, right? Who cares about this video? Who cares about government? But the activities of those with more power than you and I affect us whether we care or not. So in this video, political differences are about competing values. We already talked about that. Um, the state power, you know, state government, private government, public government, its use and abuse, philosophical basis on political principles such as rights, relationship between economics and political science, 
So effects of technology. So we're going to talk about that. So political science. We want to think about scientifically. We want to think scientifically about government and political issues. So, uh, so the different sciences, there's hard sciences and soft sciences. So examples of hard sciences are chemistry, physics, biology. So hard sciences use controlled experiments to try and demonstrate cause and effect. Soft sciences or social sciences like poli sci, political science, must look for paired examples instead. So hard sciences use controlled experiment to determine cause and effect. So examples of what hard sciences use, they create two groups as identical as possible. For example, group A gets the medicine, group B doesn't. If group A is cured in significantly higher rates, a good indication of cause and effect has been shown. So group A, experimental group, gets the thing being tested. So group B is a control group, uh, gets placebo. So they don't get a drug, they just get a drug that they say has an effect but really doesn't. So every variable between the two groups is identical except for what's being tested. So each group is the same, has equal opportunity to be part of that group and was chosen the exact same way. To be part of the group. So political science. In political science, it's often impossible to create controlled experiments. Instead, statistical analysis on data is done. Or we look for paired examples. Let's look at two paired examples to demonstrate that government affects people's lives. Okay, so that's how they, they, they figure it out. So they're looking for two paired examples. And now we're going to look at two paired examples to demonstrate that government does affect people's lives. So right here, you guys can see. South Korea, dark North Korea. They need to get as close as they can in order to, to determine how government affects people's lives. And these two groups have to be as similar as possible. So that's why Korea is a tremendously significant pair South Korea and North Korea the same people you would think they look the same they come from the same place similar foods culture you think you think that would be the same so Korea is a 5,000 year old civilization so 70 years old is that they've been split for 70 years a civil war led to the peninsula being divided into two countries that's that was happened 70 years ago a country that's been around for 5,000 years and that that major split, that major division, it is logical to predict two countries consisting of essentially the same people and culture would be similar. However, we know they're not. So the health differences, South Korea versus North Korea. In South Korea, infant mortality affects four out of every 1,000 children, infants. and then, But in North Korea, 27 out of every 1,000 infants die. Compared to South Korea, which is four out of every 1,000. Children underweight are developing or not developing properly. So 4% of the children in South Korea are underweight or develop improperly. Compared to nearly 50% of children underweight and developing improperly. 47% in North Korea. Children overweight in South Korea is only 7%. 0% of children in North Korea are overweight. So they're actually malnourished. 7% in South Korea, hey, it's not too bad, but they've only been living this Western civilization type of culture for only 70 years, right? <clears throat> so 7% is still considerably low. So average adult male height in South Korea, it's 5 and 9 inches. In North Korea, it's 5 and 6 inches. That's average adult male height. That's particularly short for, that's a good height for a woman in America. But for a man, 5'6 is pretty short. So M economic variable, per capita GDP, 47000 in South Korea, only $1,800 in North Korea. Roads paved, 92% of the roads are paved in South Korea and only 3% of the roads are paved in North Korea. Internet use, 83% of the people in South Korea use the internet, only 0.1% use internet, probably just the government. Military spending, 2 2.8 of the GDP is spent on military in South Korea. 22.3% of the GDP global, the global spending, North Korea spends extremely amount of money. Out of all the countries who spend money, they take up 23% of all the countries who spend money on military. Wow. 
So South Korea, among the global leaders in science, tech, and trade, culturally influential worldwide, democracy, and free markets. North Korea, among the poorest countries in the world, virtually no economic or cultural global influence, communist dictatorship, every aspect of life controlled by the government, people's contact with outside world strictly controlled. So the reason why this is considered a political science and how this varies from being able to get s samples, it's hard to get samples of countries. A lot of countries are t completely different. But the reason why they're so, there's it's such a good sample is because these people are the same people, just divided culturally. The pair of countries with similar populations would be expected to have similar societies, but in fact, they are drastically different. When we look at the treatment, the thing that is different between the groups, we can reasonably conclude that the different government systems cause the differences in health, economic, and social outcomes. Therefore, too much government can be harmful for society. Another example is El Paso and Juarez, Mexico, which only separated by a border. Two cities across an international border. The cities are culturally, economically, and socially integrated. Region has population of about 3 million. So 3 million people live in that region of El Paso and Juarez. Every day, 60,000 pedestrians, 80,000 cars, 300 buses, 15,000 commercial trucks, and 500 train cars cross the border in the region. That's every day. 80% of El Paso residents identify as Mexican-American. 90% of Juarez residents identify as Mexican. So, uh, but there's differences. So this is, we're trying to figure out how government, this is the introduction, how government affects <clears throat> countries. So in El Paso, Texas, which is so close, you see how they, they mix, right? You see the differences, they, they cross borders to do business, visit family, etc., eat, you know. This is, this is the 2010 crime stats, statistics. So in El Paso, El Paso has the lowest crime rates of all large and mid-sized cities in America. In other words, no other U.S. city had larger population and lower crime rates. But Ciudad Juarez, which everybody knows, is one of, was one of, a couple years ago was one of the most violent places almost in the world. So 2010 crime stats for Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua. Shout out my grandfather, rest in peace, he was from there. Juarez had a murder rate of 290 per year, 10 times higher than any U.S. city, 20 times higher than El Paso. See that Juarez in 2010, everybody knows the rival gangs fought each other for control of drugs and successfully corrupted the law and took control over parts of the city. In other words, there lacked a functioning government. We can conclude that not enough governing order also can be harmful to society. By 2015, murders in Juarez dropped to levels near the highest U.S. cities, although still significantly higher than El Paso. The drop is attributed to federal police and the Mexican army deploying to the city to reestablish order. However, in recent, murder, recent years, murder rates have risen again. So in 2010, El Paso only had 0.6. Only had 0.6. The whole year had like, only, only averaged 0.6. I don't know if that's per month or a whole year. 0.6, how could that even be, right? Uh, half a person died. But 290 people died. Um, the highest in the U.S. cities was only 48 deaths. Not only, but compared to 290. Detroit, Michigan had 48 deaths in 2010. Los Angeles had 7.3. I don't know if that's a month. I'm not sure that a day. It doesn't really say. It's kind of low, right? I feel like people would die more, but that's murder. So I'm not sure how high that is. 2015, 1.7 people died in El Paso. Again, I don't really know the frequency. And Watt is 23 died. So that's a significant change in five years, 290 to 23. Uh, and that year, 2015, Baltimore had the highest with 50. In Los Angeles, it went down about two point about point two percent. Twenty twenty one, two deaths in El Paso, it's still higher, gradually growing. And Juarez had ninety deaths, so they went back from twenty three back to ninety. And St. Louis, Missouri, had sixty four deaths, and Los Angeles went up about three point two percent, or I don't know. Um, that's by year, so these statistics are by year because there is a graph right here that says by year. Anyway, so we can conclude the government structure we live under affects us, whether we understand or pay attention to it. Next time, okay. So what this is saying is how we go about political science, you know. So. <clears throat> so political values and trade-offs. It's very interesting. From where do we get our rights? So in the beginning, or even today, some people say our rights are natural. Some say rights are social. 
we're born. That's just what it is. People are going to fight to be free because that's natural. That's inside of us. We were born with this desire to be free, to have liberty, to have to want to be able to do what we want, not be told what to do. Some say rights are social. Some say the men say this just happens because it also seems kind of close to the natural side too, but social men are going to make the laws. Not everybody desires to be free. Only certain people do, so these laws were made by them to be able to live free as possible. And other people who aren't as smart just have to follow it. So natural rights. Thomas Jefferson, who, who wrote the Declaration of Independence, 1776. This is what he says. Rights come from laws of nature and of nature's God. We hold these truths to be self-evident. So, duh, it's obvious that rights are natural. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. We'll talk about that after. Among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Martin Luther King, Natural Rights. Martin Luther King, Letter from Birmingham Jail, 1963. A just man-made law is one that squares with natural law. An unjust law is a human law not rooted in eternal and natural law. Listen. An unjust law is created by man, but a just law is created by God and nature. So rights, rights as social construct. This view says rights aren't like laws of nature because laws of nature enforce themselves. But laws, rights, social rights, those who see rights as something that were created socially, rights are human concepts. So humans created laws that usually come from struggle with one another and they are always open to change and improvement. But where do we get our rights, whether natural or social? Our rights do not come from government. We give government its rights and power. That's what they say. That's what they believe. That's what the ones that created, who rebelled against England, they wanted their rights. So they also didn't trust government. They're coming from a government they rebelled against. They didn't trust it. So views of government, a negative view, government is a necessary evil. Positive view, government is a tool we can use to do good. So the negative view of government, why is it a necessary? What's the necessary in it's a necessary evil? Necessary because human beings are far from perfect and without some authority we would have chaos. Why evil in that statement, government is a necessary evil? Why evil? Because human beings are far from perfect and those people with governmental authority will abuse their power. So view it as this. Under this view, government is like an insurance policy. No one wants it. We're forced to have it. No one wants to use it. And you have to constantly watch the insurance company because if they can, they will rip you off. But it's smart to have insurance. Nobody wants to pay for it until you get in an accident and you don't have it. Or your house burns down you wish you had home insurance. So the positive view of government, this view reminds us that private power, like corporations or even other people, is also a threat to our freedom. If we didn't have government, it was a free-for-all. Look, at, we have government, there's still bullshit going on. We are a self-governed people. So government is us coming together to make a better society. Remember, we are the government. That's what they were believing in the beginning. It sounds different now. Government is a tool that can be used to help those in need, protects us from pollution, and makes the world a better place. Are rights natural or social? Should we have a positive or negative view of government? It's up to you to decide what to think. Those who wrote the Constitution thought rights were natural and had a negative view of government. There are some political ideas on which just about everyone agrees. So look at so look, those who wrote the Constitution. Those who, who founded America thought rights were natural because they were escaping from a place who created laws and were saying, no, you got to follow our rules. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> we're not going to follow your rules. Like, we have a desire inside us that's natural, that we want to be free. We're not going to be held down. If we find this land and we want to live... England was trying to give orders to America from far. The king was trying to, like, control people from way, like fucking far away that's why he was sending his troops English troops to try to control the the um, the, the, the what do they call them the English rebels you know the ones that became America and they had a negative view of government obviously but however there are some political ideas on which just everyone agrees 
These are called political values. Political values are beliefs about which goals, principles, political values are beliefs about which goals, principles that we want our society to promote. Political values are, they often serve as foundations for government actions and our political beliefs. There are many political values we will discuss. Three, liberty, which is freedom, order, everybody wants to, to be safe, and equality, everybody wants equal rights. They tend to be universal values, means everybody likes these, right? Everybody wants freedom, everybody wants order, everybody wants equality. So order, we want safety, security, stability, peace, healthiness, and cleanliness. Everybody can agree, right? Everybody wants safety, security, stability, peace, healthiness, and cleanliness. We don't want violence, crime, chaos. Order is promoted by the establishing and enforcement of laws. <clears throat> Liberty, we want freedom, autonomy, which is the ability to be responsible for our own life, and independence, and privacy. We don't want to be told what to do with our lives. Liberty is promoted by allowing everyone to make their own decisions based on their own wishes. So the last of the three examples is equality. We want everyone to have the same opportunities. We don't want unfairness, racial, gender, discrimination, poverty. Equality is promoted by ensuring everyone has access to the same resources, redistri redistribution of resources, and, and you know the fight against discrimination. <clears throat> but political values and trade-offs. This is pretty interesting. These three political values are probably universal when viewed independently. <clears throat> I mean, everybody agrees, independently of each other. But they're not. They're dependent upon each other. However, when we try to implement them together, we realize they are in conflict and we must make trade-offs of these political values. For example, order versus liberty. We could end nearly all crime and have a very secure society if we gave up most of our rights. We could have a more harmonious society with much less conflict if everyone was the same religion or a single culture was enforced, right? We wouldn't disagree. That's why I believe nationalism is important. So an example of order versus liberty. I don't know if you guys knew this. I didn't know this. In Singapore, it's known for being clean, orderly society with an extremely low crime rate. Why? Because they have extremely harsh penalties for things that are minor crimes or even legal in the U.S. I mean, if you wouldn't know that. Another example is in Quebec, Canada. Order versus liberty. You want to save society, but you also want to be free. You need trade-offs. So Quebec is the only majority French-speaking province of Canada. They have strict rules to preserve French language and culture. Trip out. There was a UFC fight. No, it was actually a boxing match yesterday. It was Callum Smith or one of the Smith brothers versus Better Baev. And Better Baev is from Quebec, Canada. And a lot of times you go, even they fight in Mexico, they might translate, they might not. But they made sure that they translated in French. So in Quebec, Canada, KFC, it's Kentucky Fried Chicken. But they have a KFC in Quebec, Canada. And KFC has became, it's their brand, right? We know it's an acronym, but it's a brand. So it's in Mexico, wherever else, it's still going to say KFC. It could say, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken. It could be like KFP, right? Or Cocina, uh, Kentucky, Cocina, Pollo, KCP, right? No, but it's KFC because that's a, a brand. But in Quebec, Canada, which has strict laws to to continue to, to, to preserve the French language and culture, it's PFK, which some French words make up. It translates to Kentucky Fried Chicken, but they made sure the acronym was PFK. That's liberty versus order. Just an example, right? So liberty versus equality. Freedom, but everybody, everybody wants freedom, but we want equal rights, right? Economic equality comes at the expense of others' property rights. So everybody wants everybody to be equal, but then who has to suffer? The highly motivated, the conscientious, the ones that are striving to obtain for themselves and their future families, you know. People have to give up their land if everybody's going to be equal. A system of pure freedom will lead to massive economic inequality. So a system that's free for everybody to get what they want, it's free for all, there'll be 
it's it's we're more similar to that right now where a lot of inequality right that's liberty versus inequality these are trade-offs many controversial political issues are arguments about which political values should be prioritized in a situation think about the different values those who disagree with you are prioritizing so if you get into some sort of political argument think about which values that they're prioritizing over which maybe you disagree with them on so um, we'll keep going this, I'm almost up to 30 minutes of this video if I have to do it in parts so an overview of the U.S. Constitution this is the intro to political science so topics the first constitution of the U.S. motivations of the framers those who framed the constitution the structure of the constitution of the United States interesting fact I didn't know this what is the name of this country the United States of America a weird name it's plural it's not singular United and states are usually common nouns. We're united. Oh, what, what, what mind state are you in? Contrast with the exclusive proper nouns of Mexico, Brazil, Canada, Italy, Pakistan, Iran, etc. Therefore, American is a U.S. demonym when America is technically the Western Hemisphere. That's, 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 that's um... I want to see what demonym is. Define demonym. Demonym. A noun used to denote the natives or inhabitants of, part, of a particular country, state, city, etc. A noun used to denote the natives. What's an example of a demonym? Uh, examples of demonyms include for someone from the city of. French, a person from France, Swahili, for a person in Swahili. <laughs> <coughs> um, so anyway, the United States of America, what are the states and are they united? The states in political science means the government. So the definition of state, the institution with a monopoly on the legitimate use of force in a, in a specific territory, has a responsibility for making, implementing, enforcing, and education a, no, adjudication, important policies in that territory. The fact that the political subdivisions in the U.S. are called states shows how they were originally conceived. So each initially was kind of its own country. The United States of America, the Declaration of Independence written in 1776 referred to the nation as United States of America. In the U.S. Constitution, it was United States of America. Before the Civil War, which was from 1861 to 1865, the common usage was the United States are. They were, they were considered to be all its own separate thing. The United States are, or these United States, like it was a group. But after the Civil War, the common usage, how we use it today, is the United States is. It's spoken as if it's one united country. The United States. The United States is. Not they are. Considered to be one. The United States of America. Under the first constitution, which was the Articles of Confederation, the states part was more or less correct, the united part less so, because they weren't really united, they were considered to be separate. Under the second constitution, which is the one we have today with the 27 amendments, and still with the Articles of, Confeder of Confederation, the united part is more or less correct, the state part less so. We're not separate no more. We're not a separate state. Okay, so, so that's why I say it's different now. So the Articles of Confederation, it was the first constitution of the U.S. and only lasted eight years. So the Articles of Confederation established a weak national government. Those who sought more power, those who sought for a more powerful national government pushed for it to be replaced. Remember, they came from a place that was trying to govern them harshly, which is why they rebelled. So they didn't want a strong national government. But those who did want more national gov more a stronger national government pushed for it to be replaced. So here's, here's an idea of the mistrust that the founding fathers had. So George Washington quotes, Few men have virtue to withstand the highest bidder. Few men have virtue to set to withstand sailing out. It's a long ass time ago. 
John Adams, the only maxim of a free government ought to be trust no one. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, experience has shown that even under the best forms of government, those entrusted with power have in time and by slow operation perverted it into tyranny. So interesting. So the U.S. Constitution, who were the framers, what were their concerns, and what did they produce? So the framers were the elite of their society. They were hypocrites, though. They were, they, were, they were slave owners, but they were idealistic. And what were, their, what were the concerns of the framers? They mistrusted each other. They mistrusted regular people. You know, this, they mistrusted society. They wanted a government that reflected this mistrust. So what did they produce? A government in which the powerful fight each other for control and nobody could win. A very limited democracy, majority rule with minority rights, but a government that is stable. So again, a government in which the powerful fight each other for control, but nobody could win, which in turn creates the balance of powers, separation of powers, checks and balances, the three branches of government. So in the Constitution, the Articles of Confederation established the legislative branch, which we know is separated in two parts, Congress, separated in two parts, House of Representatives and the Senate. There's two Senate, there's two senators for each state, and the House of Representatives, the population determines how many are seated in the House of Representatives. That represents each state off their based off the population of that state. So if you have less population, you might have fewer House of Representatives, you have more. Like California, you're going to have more House of Representatives. But each state gets only two senators. I want to talk about the Senate when we get there. Three, three branches of government. The legislative branch, which is the U.S. Congress, <clears throat> which is the U.S. Capitol. That's where Congress is, is in the nation's capital. They write the laws. The second is the executive branch, which is the White House. That's the president. The president tries, he tries to push it through. The president and the vice president are part of the executive branch. They execute the law. But thank God for the judicial branch. The judicial branch is the Supreme Court. They're the judges. They, 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 make sh they are the last line of defense for the people. They make sure you know, that these laws are constitutional. So the legislative branch, which is the House of the U.S. Capitol, which is Congress, House of Representatives, and the Senate, they're the legislative branch. They write and legislate the law. The executive branch, which is the White House, the president and the vice president, they carry or enforce or execute law. The judicial branch, which are our judges, they interpret the law or adjudicate the law. So what does adjudicate mean? Adjudicate. Adjudication. <clears throat> the action or process of adjudicating, duh. A formal judgment on a disputed matter. So they, they kind of, they, they are there to, yeah, interpret the law for us. You know, they're supposed to interpret it, kind of adjudicate it. Um, make a formal judgment or decision about a problem or disputed matter. Act as a judge in a competition. So the idea of a very limited democracy, majority rule with minority rights. Majority rule with minority rights. Rights can't be taken away by vote. Protects everyone, particularly rich and powerful. So a limited democracy, democratic nature of the branches. So the legislative branch, again, House of Representatives, which is Congress, Members elected by Democratic vote, the Senate. Members elected by Democratic vote since 1913, appointed by state governments prior. I have an idea about the Senate. They're the ones we shouldn't trust. Thank God for the House of Representatives. The Senate in history, I'm reading a book on the death, the, 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 the murder of Julius Caesar, and the Senate are the rich people. They're the ones we shouldn't trust. So easily. So the Senate, okay, so, bef so so the House of Representatives were always elected by a vote. Democratic vote, everybody who's of age 
can vote. Nowadays, before we'll, we'll read how America was pretty crooked. But prior to 1913, was appointed by state governments. So the executive branch, the president, elected via the electoral college. We'll go over the electoral college later. It's very interesting as well. Judicial branch, which is our federal judges, appointed by president, confirmed by Senate. I'm telling you, the Senate holds a lot of power. Initially, half of one branch of Democrats. So initially, half of one branch, Democratic in nature, which was the House of Representatives. Since 1913, one branch, Democratic in nature. A government that is stable. So stability is related to order. In order to keep a place stable, you have to have laws. A stable society is slow to change. Predictable. Like majority rule versus minority rights, stability in society is good for everyone, but it's particularly good particularly good for the rich and powerful. So the U.S. Constitution has been long-standing, it's been enduring, and has been emulated across the world. So the, this makes up the U.S. Constitution. Remember, the first one was called the Seven Articles of Confederation. Okay, we'll continue. So the Seven Articles were created in 1789. It laid out the powers of the government. But that same year, the Anti-Federalists, the ones who didn't really trust, they created the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights, remember this, are the first ten amendments in the Constitution. The first ten corrections, revisions, ads, takeaways. You would call them the... Uh, they were the precautionary you know, changes. The Bill of Rights, same year. The Bill of Rights in 1789 when the seven Articles of Confederation were created. The amendments, so the Bill of Rights are the first ten amendments. They were established rights for all citizens, laid out what the government cannot do. <clears throat> and since then, since 1789, only 17 amendments have been ratified, have been accepted, up until today. The last amendment that was ratified was, I think, 19, either 1994, 1995, or 1996. And what it was, it was to allow government, I don't know, exactly what part of government, but to be able to create their own, to control their own salary wage. So the, uh, so the, the 11th Amendment through 27th Amendment established more rights and it changed parts of the Articles. So the seven Articles were created by the Federalists and the Bill of Rights created by the Anti-Federalists. So the Bill of Rights was the result of a compromise. Those who did not want a powerful national government only agreed to the new constitution if the Bill of Rights was included. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So the U.S. Constitution, again... Seven Articles, created 1789, laid out the powers of the government, Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments, created that same year, established rights for all citizens, laid out what the government cannot do. So the Article 1 of the Constitution established the legislative branch, established the power to create laws. Article 2 of the Seven Articles of Confederation, the beginning of the Constitution, established executive branch, established that power of president to push the law through. Article 3, establish judicial branch, establish a, establish a category for those to be able to interpret it, to know the law enough to put it into effect. Article 4, federal relations, full faith and credit clause states must respect public acts records and, and judicial proceedings of every other state for example if you have California place and you go to another state they shouldn't have to charge you because you're in their state it kind of separated powers it took a little bit of power from each state and made them all united within one nation federal relations so there's full faith that you're you're paying all your taxes in that city. There's a full faith that you're doing the right thing. So they, they don't, they, they're not going to tax you for being in their state. <clears throat> That's just an example of what, what that did. So Article 5 of the Constitution, the seven articles, amendment process. 
the process of how to create a new amendment to add to the Constitution. The amendment can be proposed by either, these are the rules. So an amendment can be, be proposed by two thirds of both houses of Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate, or two thirds of the states. Then to be ratified, amendment must be approved by three fourths of the states. Which we live in a divided nation, so that seems like I mean, obviously only 17 amendments within the last 200 and odd years, so it's hard to get an amendment ratified. The seven articles, so anyway, Article 6, the federal government, this, this established the federal government. Supremacy clause, federal law supersedes state law. Inter, like, you know, weed, for example, weed. International treaties supersede the Constitution. I want to have a little, <laughs> have a little, uh, little bad taste about that. International treaties supersede the Constitution. What does that mean? Can you make a treaty with somebody if, if the deal is right to control our nation? You know, to consult, to consult, you know. Article 7 is the process of ratification of the amendments. Here we go, the Bill of Rights. The first 10 amendments of the U.S. Constitution, also known as the Bill of Limits. Rights are principles that attempt to limit power. A result of compromise between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Supposedly, the rights are for people and the things you hate. Rights are for the people and the things you hate. Example. A right should be so believed in for the right of all people that you would even want that right for the people you don't even like and the things you hate. But you believe in that law. You believe in that right as a human that you would even want that same right for those you don't even like. <coughs> Makes me think about when you go to jail. Like, I wouldn't worth that on my enemy. You hear that all the time. So the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances, to protest. The First Amendment talks about our freedom of speech, that there shouldn't be no religion put upon the people that they must follow that religion. The First Amendment, there cannot be an established religion. All citizens have freedom of religion, freedom of speech, Freedom of the press, freedom to peaceably assemble, freedom to petition government and seek redress. So let's delve deeper briefly on the First Amendment, specifically free speech. What should be the limits of free speech? <coughs> there are limits. You can't falsely yell fire in a crowded theater. There's a case, Supreme Court case, Shank versus the United States, 1919. The court ruled encouraging draft resistance was a clear and present danger and therefore could be considered illegal speech. So in the case Shank versus United States in 1919 during the First World War, they considered anybody during war who protested against the war as illegal speech. So the First Amendment, free speech. What should be the limits of free speech? Hate speech, obscenity, sedition, threats, incitement, defamation. Again, liberty versus order. We want to keep order, but we also want to be free. Those are trade-offs. First Amendment free speech. This is interesting. This is very interesting. If you made it this far, really hear this. In free speech, there should be no prior restraint. The right to free speech is not absolute under our current law. But prior restraint is not allowed. It may not be determined in advance what content, what content is protected and what is not. So, so laws are man-made. There are natural laws, but just like, are you born this way or are you not? You know, is it, is it nature? Is it nurture? Because this is a man-made law. No prior restraint. You have freedom of speech, but we're not going to tell you. You have freedom of speech, but not everything is going to be legal. 
but we're not going to tell you what it is, what content is legal and what is illegal. That's kind of weird. So on to the Second Amendment. So that's called no prior restraint. The Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. <coughs> like you know, don't 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 infringe upon my right to protect myself. So the idea of the Second Amendment, there's two uncertainties, but the closest thing we can get to really interpreting what that means. Remember, they're coming from a place they were rebelling. They were unsure. They, let, they distrusted people. At the time when they wrote this, there was no standing army. There was no army. So some people interpret a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So there's an idea. What they were saying is that each state, each person within each state is responsible to defend your land and your nation. So we know a well-regulated militia, a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free nation, a free state. So the right of the people to keep in bear arms. It doesn't say let's establish a militia. Like we come from a place that had an army. We understand a well-regulated militia is necessary for a free country. So the right of the people to bear arms. There was not like so or in turn. There was no like transitional word there. But there's an idea that since there was no standing armies, they created that to say, we're not, we don't want an army because that's fucking crazy. And armies are bad. They end up turning, they end up being tyrannical. So everybody should just get a gun and take care of themselves. Some consider that to be an endorsement of revolution. But can that idea apply to modern weapons and modern problems? up to you to interpret that and have your own opinion the third amendment which is the least used amendment no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner nor in time of war but in a manner to be pres be prescribed by law so remember they had horses back then and they're creating things off of history so they probably remember in England where people, soldiers were without any necessary admittance or without any permission, they were able just to go in your house and sleep on your couch in time of war. These people are walking from city to city, you know, pillage, not pillaging, but, you know, they're on foot during war. So they made it, that's the Third Amendment, that no soldier shall in time of peace be able to go into your house without the consent of the owner. It's funny, right? So the Fourth Amendment, quartering of soldiers, no, that's the Third Amendment, excuse me, it's still on the same one, quartering of soldiers, again, this idea that British force colonists to house soldiers when needed, it's the least invoked of Bill of Rights, of the Bill of Rights, partial basis, okay, so this is a partial, so when people were fighting for the right to privacy, they, they went back to this idea. So this is the partial basis of declared right to privacy. We're going we're gonna to get there. <clears throat> so the Fourth Amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause. Supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So the Fourth Amendment is the judicial check on the executive. The president can't just say, go to his house. I just have an inkling that this guy's illegal. Go to his house, search him, take him to jail. So God bless the judicial branch. Even though some judges, you feel like they could be bought, right? Just like fucking John Adams said or whatever. So the Fourth Amendment established probable cause and established the mandate for warrant requirements. That's, so the Fifth Amendment, the due process, guarantees rights of the accused, protects against double jeopardy. The accused cannot be forced to self-incriminate. 
I plead the fifth, remember. I plead the fifth is saying I want to use my fifth amendment as an American citizen, but also establish the eminent domain. If the government needs to create a road going through your property, they could do it without. They try to settle and pay you, but if they really want to, they could just take your stuff. So the fifth amendment, let's talk about the right to remain silent. I plead the fifth for the guilty and the innocent. That the right to remain silent is for the guilty and the innocent. And later I'm going to do a small video about this. So don't talk to the police. It protects everybody from ambiguities. Something ambiguous is open to more than one interpretation, right? And that's when you go to court and you have to... It's not he did it, he didn't do it. You're fighting for it. So it's open to interpretation by the jury. So I plead the fifth is for everybody, not just the guilty, but also for the innocent protects everybody from the ambiguities the ambiguities of criminal of criminal justice system we'll get back to that in another video the sixth amendment habeas corpus trial by jury speedy public impartial and a right to counsel to have a lawyer the seventh amendment to have a civil trial by jury and the findings of fact by a civil jury cannot be overturned and the Eighth Amendment, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punish, punishments inflicted. So that created the prohibition of excessive bail and fines, protection against cruel and unusual punishment. It was also part of, I think, no, I think that was number 18, never mind. The Ninth Amendment, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. It protects rights not mentioned in the Constitution. Says list of rights in Constitution is not exhaustive. For example, used to declare right to privacy. We'll get back to it. There's a strict interpretation and a broad interpretation of the law and of the amendments. The final, the Tenth Amendment. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So as the power is reserved by the states and or the people, says list of powers in the Constitution is exhaustive. So it's kind of like that 9 and 10 are kind of going at it a little bit. It's kind of weird. Um, so a right to privacy. <clears throat> judicial, we're going to go over the right to privacy, the judicial review, and the strict versus the broad interpretation of the laws, the amendments, and the uh, Articles of Confederation. So what is judicial review? The power of the courts to declare laws unconstitutional. In the U.S., there is only concrete judicial review. The power can only be exercised when tied to a specific case. So let's, let's go over some examples. So strict versus broad interpretation. So strict interpretations. They avoid inferences when interpreting constitution or statute. Meaning there's no abstract. It's concrete. They're not saying, oh, it might mean this. No, it says what it says. So the strict interpretators. So this is mostly for judges. The strict interpretators, they read the plain meaning of the text. What, what this does, it protects from excessive government and from giving unelected federal judges too much power. So the broad interpreters of the Constitution, they say the Constitution is a living document designed to be adaptive. It says nothing on how it should be interpreted. For example, we smoke weed now. Why are you going to give me a federal crime for smoking weed? Like, you know, let's, come on, let's go with the times now, you know. So those are broad and, and in some instances, you know, you, you want, I have an example. So anyway, another idea of the broad interpreters. It allows constitution to reflect society and has allowed for expansion of rights to previously excluded groups. You know, so people, people, I don't know. I feel like the broad interpretation could be a little better. It just depends. If you ever been in jail, I've seen this many times where especially serious crimes, because they pay for lawyers, they pay for private lawyers and, a, a good private lawyer, they'll jump from courtroom to courtroom and have a conversation with with different judges 
and kind of get which one is more lenient or not, and they'll move. That's a good judge. They'll move wherever they feel like they have a better chance with a certain judge. They'll move courtrooms to go chase that judge who they feel would give them a better, you know, better better plea deal, etc. So, right to privacy. Do we have a right to privacy? The U.S. Constitution does not explicitly grant this right. It doesn't say you have a right to privacy. It doesn't say that. It doesn't explicitly say it. It implicitly says it. Thank God for the judicial branch. The Supreme Court has ruled that it is implied from other expressively guaranteed rights. So, there's, okay, we'll keep going. So this is an, is an example. Remember, <clears throat> judicial, okay, look at the U.S. In the U.S., there was only concrete judicial review. <laughs> this is an example. This is an example. Griswold versus Connecticut, 1965. This is the case. Estelle T. Griswold and C. Lee Buxton versus Connecticut, 1965. In 1961, the executive director of the Planned Parenthood League of Connecticut, Griswold, so this is about Planned Parenthood. And a doctor slash professor at Yale Medical School, Buxton, opened a medical clinic with the, with the intent of violating and challenging the constitutionality of the state's prohibition against birth control. So the government, the government's not just going to change a law because you want them to. They want to see some sort of effort. In plain words, they want to see some sort of effort. So the birth control was illegal in 1961. But the executive director of Planned Parenthood and a doctor of Yale, they knew, they knew that what they were doing was going to be illegal. And they knew they were violating the law. So they took it to court. So you have to kind of commit an act. You have to kind of break the law to change the law. So in 1879, the law states any person who uses any drug, medicinal article, or instrument for the purpose of preventing conception shall be fined not less than $50 or imprisoned not less than 60 days, no more than one year, or be both fined and imprisoned. Another one, any person who assists, abets, counsels, causes, hires, or commands another to commit in any offense may be prosecuted and punished as if he were the principal offender. So the decision, right to martial privacy. So in a 7-2 to two decision, the court ruled the law unconstitutional. And this is this. Griswold and those who supported Griswold's stance versus Connecticut these are some of the arguments. Would we allow the police to search the sacred precincts of marital bedrooms for telltale signs of the use of contraceptives? The very idea is repulsive to the notions of privacy surrounding the marriage relationship. Pretty much, you can't control people. You're not going to go in the room where they're having sex and say, hey, hey, are you guys using illegal uh, contraceptives? Oh, no, no. Okay, hey, continue. You know, it, it's just impossible. Like, you're just, what are you doing? So the law intrudes upon the right of martial privacy. So the decision, right to martial privacy. Again, this right of privacy is not expressly, not expressly declared in the Constitution. But specific guarantees in the Bill of Rights have penumbras. Penumbras are shadows. So specific guarantees of the Bill of Rights have shadows formed by the light from those guarantees that help give them life and substance. So specific guarantees in the Bill of Rights have shadows formed by emanations, the more obvious wording of specific things from those guarantees that help give them life and substance. So here, here are the penumbras and the emanations, right? Meaning like, right to free speech. Wait, 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 the zone of privacy. So freedom of assembly, the First Amendment. People need to get together and have sex. Like we have the right to get together. That they feel like there's a penumbra. There, there's there's something within that in that that amendment that's that supports the right to privacy. The third amendment, freedom from peacetime quartering of soldiers. You're not gonna come into my house to make sure that like you know I'm not having sex, right? It's kind of vague though. 
So number four, freedom from unreasonable search and seizures. You're not going to come and check me all the time when having sex to make sure I'm not using a certain drug. Freedom from self-incrimination. I plead the fifth. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. This right to privacy emanating from these constitutional guarantees cannot be revoked without proper justification or due process of law. I'm not sure how they got away with that one. I don't know. Maybe they looked to the future and had some common sense. Like, you know, people don't want to have babies and let them not have babies. Like, you know, we don't want a bunch of misfits or incest and rape, etc. Maybe they saw the future where it was going. If you really take time to think about it, if you're a smart individual who knows history, I mean, you would have to know what, what kind of society was being created. So the expansion of the right to privacy. Einstadt versus Bear. Another example. 1972. Any prohibition on contraception, a violation of right to privacy regardless of marital statuses. It doesn't matter if you're single. It doesn't matter if you just want to fuck. You're able to have contraceptives. Roe versus Wade, 1973. Right to privacy found in 14th Amendment's right to liberty and 9th Amendment's reservation of rights to the people. Hence, outright prohibitions on abortion are unconstitutional. <laughs> Taking away people's freedom. That's what they're saying. But the critiques of Griswold, the, the um, Planned Parenthood, right to privacy is not expressively stated in the text. Again, strict interpretation. Not expressly stated in the text of the Constitution. Usurped rights of the states and the people to enact laws regulating public safety and morality, rights retained by the people and by the states. So is it... it Everybody knows, not everybody knows about Roe vs. Wade, but people have heard about it. So, <clears throat> Roe vs. Wade in 1973. Until then, abortion was illegal in 45 states. Supreme Court of the United States ruled such laws violated the constitutional right to privacy as interpreted in Griswold. After the Supreme Court of the United States decided states could not ban abortions up around 20 weeks of pregnancy. After that, it's illegal. So the Supreme Court of the United States overturned Roe v. Wade in Dobbs v. Jackson recently in 2022. States now may ban abortion. So the Supreme Court of the United States overturned Roe v. Wade in Dobbs v. Jackson 2022. States now may ban abortion. Um, states like Texas, Tennessee, they I don't know, whatever is next to Texas and to the right of it a bit. Um, restrictions after 12 weeks, that's after three months, and like in Florida, uh, California's restrictions after 22 weeks, after about four or five months, you can't have an abortion. Um, so civil rights, <clears throat> here we go, civil rights, the difference between civil liberties and civil rights. So civil liberties are our personal freedoms and our individual rights. What governments cannot do. Civil rights refers to political rights such as voting and equal protection under the law and often revolves around treatment of certain identity groups. Race, gender, disability, sexual orientation, etc. What governments must do to ensure equal protection and freedom from discrimination. Civil rights at the founding of the United States of America. The ideal, all men are created equal. But the reality, many excluded from political process, including the enslaved people, women, Native Americans, free African Americans, indentured servants, and the landless. Here's some statistics. Voting in the first presidential election, 1789. Those who were excluded from voting. Native Americans, which made up 1% of the population, the free black Americans made up 2%, the landless adult white males made up 10%, enslaved black Americans 18%, white males underage 25%, white females 38%. So the only per people eligible to vote in 1789 when the constitution was actually written and amended, white males who owned land over 21. It was a 21 year old you got to be 21. So the Reconstruction Era was 1863, it's 14 years, through 1877. That was 
post the emancipation, <laughs> free free black Americans, and after the Civil War era. So 11 former Confederate states were economically and culturally devastated. Reforms in the South directed and enforced by the federal government. So the Reconstruction Era. Confederate states not allowed in Congress until pro-democracy laws and the Reconstruction Amendments were enacted and enforced. The era ended with withdrawal of federal troops in 1877. Jim Crow era begins, lasts until the 1960s, so nearly 100 years. So the Reconstruction Era Amendments. So these amendments were created during the Reconstruction Era of the United States after the Civil War. The 13th Amendment was created and abolished slavery in 1865. The 14th Amendment in 1868, equal protection under the law for all people. And the 15th Amendment in 1870, that's when all men, universal male suffrage, suffrage, the ability to vote. So the 15th Amendment gave everybody all, all men the power to vote. <clears throat> but there was something going on. We know what it was and we know what was created after that. Sharecropping. Sharecropping is the form feudalism took in the American South post-Civil War. Feudalism is a system of agricultural production used commonly throughout history and across the world. The serfs, the, the, the rebellion of the serfs in Russia, that was the feudal period where the rich controlled them by, by this. Feudalism is a system of agricultural production used commonly throughout history and across the world. Under such a system, a few landowners hold vast tracts of land while the majority of people farm the land in exchange for living on it. The produce of the land belongs to the landowner under its most exploitive forms, the tenant farmers, sometimes called landless peasants, must buy all the land, must buy all the additional needs and wants from the landowner. It's, oh, you need some fucking blankets, or you need to, you know, you, you have to pay me rent. You work for me, but you still got to pay for your living. Or you want food, you got to pay for your food. It's coming out of your check, and they end up with nothing. However, no source of income. This leaves the tenants in perpetual debt and under virtual slavery. What fucking changed? Voting rights, voting barriers in the South during Jim Crow era. Let's see that. Oh, white primary. Meaning only white people could vote at the primary. So we have a primary to vote. Each party has a primary where, where, where each party is kind of is um, debating against themselves. And then they vote. The people who vote for that party, they're going to pick their main representative to represent at the general election. But at this time, it was only an all-white primary. Only white men could vote for the primary. Grandfather Clause. Grandfather Clause is, oh, if your grandfather was able to vote, you're able to vote. The blacks, they never were never able to vote. So whose grandfather was able to vote? So they were not able to vote. It's just uh, loopholes. Uh, corruption. A poll tax. Blacks were poor. They're not able to come up with the money to pay the fee to be able to vote. Literate, literacy test. They didn't know how to read or write. So th these are voting barriers. The white primary, grandfather clause, poll tax, and literacy test. Segregation. Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896. Separate but equal doctrine. Supreme Court says segregation is constitutional if the facilities are equal. If I create the same water fountain for this guy that I do for that guy, but he's white and he's black, it's constitutional. But the Brown versus the Board in 1954, Supreme Court reverses Plessy decision, says segregation is unconstitutional. It brings an end to, to de jure, D-E space jure, de jure. It brings an end to de jure segregation, but de facto segregation remains. De jure segregation is segregation by law. De facto segregation is segregation by human nature. People who look the same, from the same culture, tend to migrate and want to live around each other. 
like a, a, a natural segregation that happens without the law. That's de facto segregation. The result of the Plessy decision. Laws requiring separate facilities for the races were allowed. Laws requiring separate facilities for the races were allowed. Equality requirement not enforced. So they didn't have to have. In that Plessy decision in, in 1896, yeah, the law required separate facilities to keep segre segregation, but to be equal. Okay, don't just make a water fountain for the whites, make one for the blacks. But didn't have to have the same quality. But up until 1954, the Brown versus the Board Supreme Court reverses. So that's um, 60, 70 years later. The uh, Supreme Court says segregation is unconstitutional. So an end to de jure segregation. An end to segregation by law. But the fact of segregation remains. <clears throat> um... So it says civil rights, it's not the laws, but human behavior and decision making. But wait. So the 14th Amendment is has five sections. <laughs> Section 1, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. So that first part of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, that, that's the power where Birthright citizenship lies. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. That's the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So that's the Due Process Clause. Nor deny to any person within his jurisdiction the Equal Protection of the Laws. Equal Protection Clause. So civil rights, immigration, citizenship clause. The privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law, nor deny to any person within his jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. No deportation without trial except when terrorism is alleged. All right. Progressive Era Amendments. The Progressive Era. 1880s to the 1920s. Some say that the Industrial Revolution was a greater change in history than was our technological revolution. The internet, cell phones, think about it. These people in the past... When they sent a letter, they, they were hoping that it would get there. It would take a month. You might pay some guy who's going to go, you know, travel on boat towards an area where you're thinking your family member might be. Or from what you know, that was the last place you've seen them or you heard that they were at. So you're trying to send a letter through the boat or send a letter through a carriage. And then all of a sudden you have communication with being able to do Morse code or some sort of technological communication that's brand new, phones. And so industry, you know, cutting cutting your labor force. And, and the Industrial Revolution did cause, did cause, you know, the Great Depression. You know, the lack, the, 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 these machines cut your costs down as a businessman, as a company owner. So, in turn, amendments were created for all these people without jobs. Protections were created for citizens. The progressive era from 1880s to 1920s. So, the 16th Amendment was created during the progressive era. The 17th Amendment, both in 1913, seven years, six years later, the 18th Amendment, and a year after that, the 19th Amendment, the Progressive Era Amendments, reaction to government corruption and corporate abuses. The Progressive Era reforms, expansion of democracy, civil service reform, anti-political party and machine politics, pro-conservation politics, 
policies, expansion of worker rights. Again, the value of the worker was so low because everybody needed work. So if, if you wanted to call off sick or you got hurt, hey, go. There's, there's a whole line outside. You're nothing. So expansion of workers' rights, expansion of aid to the needy, free universal public education, nanny state policies, protect people from our own choices, drinking and driving, doing drugs, restrictions on immigration, eugenic policies. So progressive, the name and some policies applied to modern American liberals. I don't know what that is, but eugenic policies is pretty fucked up. What is this? I want to look that up. I just learned about it, but I don't really know. So what are eugenic policies? Let's define eugenic. <laughs> eugenic policies. Many countries enacted various eugenic policies, including genetic screenings, birth control, promoting differential birth rates, marriage restriction, segregation. Okay, People who may have some gene in them that is prone to disease or like let's say it's hereditary for your family to have kidney disease. They wouldn't allow those people to have kids. That's what it is. So the 16th Amendment established the income tax. The 17th Amendment direct election of U.S. Senators. The 18th Amendment 1919, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within the importation thereof into or the exportation thereof from the United States and all territories subject to the jurisdiction thereof for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited. The 19th Amendment, women given right to vote. But in Wyoming, women were already voting since 1869. The first woman in Congress was elected in 1916. Interesting. But all around the world, nationally in the United States, women were given the right to vote in the 19th Amendment. Remember, the 15th Amendment gave all males the right to vote. Suffrage. So universal suffrage, women guaranteed right to vote. <clears throat> Might want to do a second part, but let me just finish on the civil rights. And then we'll work on... We'll, Focus on voting next video. So Civil Rights Part 1. In Civil Rights Part 1, civil rights in the U.S. until the modern civil rights movement, problem, laws that required segregation and discrimination. Solution, get rid of those laws. In Civil Rights 2, since the modern civil rights movement from 1950s, 1960s, in addition to the times when government violates rights, civil rights today is focused on the actions and intentions of private actors. It can be more challenging today to identify civil rights problems and develop solutions. For example, the modern civil rights movements brought end to de jure segregation, but de facto segregation remains. I think, I think we'll do civil rights part two later. Peace, y'all.